Hello everyone and welcome to Shop Talk. This is our monthly free live webinar class that Nicole and I host. I'm Whitney from Thrifty Whitney. Nicole is my co-host from Vintage Haven Shop. If you're seeing this, you're probably on the replay and welcome. We're so glad you're here. Today we are going to welcome a very special guest, Candace from the Vintage Vine, and we are going to chat about selling with integrity. So, hello, hello. On here. Candace, you might have to request to join um, because we just never know what Instagram is going to do with our joint sales or joint lives. Hey, I'm so glad you made it on. I wasn't sure with your other issues. So many problems lately. I, I know, I know, and we just roll with it. So, I, yeah, if it's your first time here for Shop Talk, we'd love to hear. And here is Candace. Yay! Hi, guys. Hello. Okay, guys, the ring light has to go off. Sorry, I just can't. I just can't <laughs> deal. <laughs> anyway, you guys can see me fine. All right, real quick intro as everyone is coming into the live. Like I said, this is shop talk, though this is no selling, all chat. And every month, um, Nicole and I get together and we host shop talk. Sometimes it's just us two talking and sometimes we have fabulous guests on here. And we talk about all things selling. If you would like to see any replays, they're all posted on my YouTube channel. And so you can just comment YouTube down below in the comments, all one word YouTube, and it will automatically DM you a link to the YouTube channel. And that recording from today's live will get posted within the next 24 hours so that you can go back and replay. We'll also have it on our reels. Uh, but it's a lot easier to watch on shop talk on on YouTube because um, sometimes the shop talks go for quite a bit. And just to keep things simple, um, first, if you could just make sure that you tap up here and follow. All three of us should be showing up underneath there, and because trust me, you want to be following these ladies. And down at the bottom, you're going to see a little like speech bubble with a question mark inside. That is the best place for you to put your questions if you have them simply because um, we try to watch the comment stream, but sometimes it moves pretty quickly and we want to make sure that we don't miss your question. So any question that you have throughout the live, um, just drop it, tap on that little question mark, drop it in there. And then um, towards the end, uh, we will try to go through the questions and make sure that we've addressed them all. And yeah, and today's topic is selling with integrity. Whew. I mean, wow. I mean, I knew it would be loaded but I've just been getting a lot of feedback that this is a great topic. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> someone says, sorry, join us at another time to shop with us. Candace, will you please introduce yourself and tell us all about you? Sure. Um, okay. My name is Candace. I am, I currently, currently reside in southern New Jersey. Um, I am from Pennsylvania originally. I live like literally 10 minutes from Philadelphia. Um, I started my shop in 2021. It'll be three years in November. Um, I had left a career or a company after nearly 20 years. Um, my background is in education in the finance and HR world. Um, so I left. And then I started with a new company and that company closed. So I had severance and unemployment and time off. So I decided to start the shop and it's the best thing I ever did. Um, I did go, go back to work. So I do do this full time and like the shop takes a lot of time, but I also work full time as well at an elementary school. Very cool. All right, and we have been chatting about this for quite a while. You were like one of the first people. What I loved is that you were one of the first people when we mentioned having job talk, you were like, I want to be on and I want to talk about integrity. Um, so like you just knew immediately what you wanted to chat about. So just to kind of introduce us and get us going on this topic, like why is integrity so important to you as a seller and personally? Um, I come from an entrepreneurial family. Um, I have entrepreneurial parents and grandparents and growing up, like doing business with integrity was ingrained in us from, you know, the time we knew what integrity was. So, um, and also from a personal level, um, my values 
is that everyone should be treated with respect and especially on a on a business front um you know integrity is huge if you can't trust the business that you're working with to deliver a good or a service um then they really you really shouldn't have them as a customer mm. yeah and nicole why um like kind of the same question like what does integrity mean to you and how how has that played into kind of your as you've started your business i think okay so first off before we get like too far into this if any of these things that we're saying the whole point of our conversation is not to offend anyone so if you are if you run your business a way that we say that you probably shouldn't or like anything like that just please don't take it personally it's more of just like expressing our opinions on how we want to run our own businesses and how maybe you could like better reflect on the way that you are presenting yourself your business and all of that just like a little disclaimer because i feel like this is a very I don't want to say harsh, but I feel like this is a very hard topic to discuss. Um, and things might just come out as like point blank and just don't take anything personally. Well, Sorry. and I'm just, I'm just also going to address the elephant in the room. We are going to talk about specific situations. We are not going to mention names. We will never call out shops publicly, but some of you will know exactly what we're talking about. You will have seen, and honestly, I have like a great memory because honestly, I forget usernames. I forget where I saw things happen. <laughs> I forget. Like, I mean, there's like a few names that I, that I remember, but most of the time I'm just like, I don't know where I saw this. I don't remember who told me this, but I just know that this situation exists. We're not trying to bad mouth anyone, but also I, I'm going to be very blunt. I do, I think because I'm. I'm kind of involved in a lot of different areas. I, I, I'm connected with a lot of different vintage sellers in a lot of different spheres. I hear a lot of bad stuff that goes on. And I do mm -hmm. think that we need to be like, this is like, let's, con it always comes back to me, the customer perspective. What is the, how, how is the customer perceiving that? And we're going to dive into that. And it's, I think you guys will find that very, very interesting. Sorry. I just had to, I just had to say that. Thank cool. you. <laughs> Just to clear the air, like before we proceed. But I think it should be like on your highest priority, like your list of priorities as a business owner and even as a person. Like the way you present yourself, the way you present your shop, the way you conduct your business is all a direct representation and reflection of you. So I think I'm not saying nobody's perfect. We all have flaws and everybody makes mistakes. So just with that all aside, I feel like if this is your baby, this is what you're nurturing, this is your business that you're trying to grow and maintain and make sure that like the quality stays the same as you grow and as you expand, like I feel like the underlying, I guess, principle should be that you, your integrity should always be there. You should always... And I, mm -hmm. a thing that always comes to mind is quality ref reflects pride. And I do that, I have to think about that with everything, with even with doing home renovations. So my husband will do something and I'll be like, mm, and he's like, I know quality reflects pride, I should do better. Or like if I'm going to pack an order and I'm using recycled material and I'm like, mm, this one looks a little like ratty, don't use it. Like I think because you want, like Whitney's saying, you have to, Think about it as a customer's perspective, because at the end of the day, you're a seller, you're selling items, physical items, unless you choose to do like prints or things like that. So how is the customer going to view you through the whole process, through how you sell the item, how you um, display the item, how it's like representate, represented, and then all the way through to how they're going to receive the package, what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it just kind of like envelops the whole process. Mm. Okay, one, and I, I actually did pull up the definition of um, integrity, like from the dictionary, and it is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral 
uprightness. And it kind of, it made me think back to episode six, um, which we had Marcella from Brass Antics on. And I, she talked about branding and I go back to this in my head. This is something I am thinking about all the time about business branding, who are you? And I recommend go back and watch that episode if you're a new shop, because it might seem a bit woo woo and esoteric, but it is so necessary because that's your laying the foundation for how everyone experiences you as a business owner and as a shop owner. Um, and I get to hang out with Marcella next week in a live sale. So that'll be fun. So, but she is like talked one thing. She's like, one thing she said was, what are your business values? You know, what are important to you? What feeling? And I thought this was so interesting. How do you, how do you want your customers to feel when they walk away from an interaction with you? Like, doesn't matter what kind of, like how do other shops experience you? So I had asked um, Candace and Nicole, like, what are your business values? What are your your three words that kind of reflect who you are as a shop? Um, and the three that I uh, came up with were excellence, respect, and delight. Um, excellence, I was just like, I want to have excellence, like high standards, selling excellent items, moving. I want to sell items that I don't have to constantly excuse and flaws or make excuses for, or like, oh, well, if you buy this from me, you're going to have to fix this or that, or it's not quite right. Like I want, I really want to sell excellent items. I want my standards and shipping communication, everything to be high. I want to respect the dealers that I work with, the people that buy from me, the, when I go on house calls, you know, and I'm talking with people in their homes, I want to show that I respect them. I want to respect the items, like these items that have had been around for a hundred years plus, I want to show proper respect for these and not devalue them. Um, I actually don't think that it's really a badge of pride where I, if I can undercut every other business and sell things for cheaper than everyone else does, because you're devaluing the item. I feel like that's not respectful towards those pieces and um, delight because I recognize my, I am in a luxury business. These are luxury goods. These are items no one needs to buy, right? And I want people to have delight in the pieces that they get from me. I want them to have a sense of joy and fun and pleasure and for this to be delight, like absolutely delightful. That's, I want them to walk away with you. Even if I make a mistake or something goes wrong, I want them to retain this sense of having that interaction with me. And of course the golden rule, I go back a lot to that a lot when, um, especially if something goes wrong in shipping or an item arrives damaged, like if I was the customer, what would I want the seller to do for me? Because there are times I hear about some interactions and I hear about it from the customer's perspective and it's like, if I was in their shoes, you know, I would be so upset. So that's kind of my, um, those are my like three respect, excellence and delight. So what about you guys? What are your um, business values that you bring into this? You can go Nicole. Okay. <laughs> You're there so I figured it would go clockwise. <laughs> um, so it is hard to kind of sum everything up into three words, but the three words that I came up with were authenticity, honesty, and quality. So I think all of those have to do with you as a person, you as an owner, and your items that you're selling. So authenticity, be like true to yourself, be um, authentic with how you uh, display and provide the items, authenticity in the items that you are providing. So if I'm saying something's antique, it's authentically an antique. If I'm saying it's just vintage, like you have to like understand the difference between, well, first off the vintage between, the difference between vintage and antique is, antique is over a hundred years old. And a lot of people I think just throw out antique, especially like on eBay or like Facebook marketplace. They'll be like, oh, antique, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm, that's from the fifties. So like, just be on authentic with who you are, with how your business is run and with the items that you're selling. And then honesty is a big one. So, and we might dive into this a little bit later, but just like fully disclose any issues with the items that you're selling. Be honest about, I mean, everybody has things that come up. We all have, we're all human. So like, say I'm packing orders and all of a sudden something happens with my family. Like I have to be honest with my customers because they're relying on me to get their items out on a timely, in a timely fashion. So I think with being 
honest about what's going on. Like, hey, I'm sorry. Like, I ran out of packing peanuts. I mean, this happened this morning. I ran out of packing peanuts. Like, it might be a day or two before I can get to your order. I think it's also very good to be, like, to communicate these things. So it is a form of, like, honesty and just, like, keeping people updated and then be honest about, like, the condition of the item. And if you don't know where it's from, you don't know where it's from. If you, like, I'm not going to throw out French if it's not French, if I don't know, like, 100% that it is French. And if I don't know if it's antique or, you know, those kinds of things. And then quality, I think that's self-explanatory. But quality in, like, what you provide, quality of service, quality of goods, um, whether someone buys a tomato spoon for, say, $20 or they buy, like, a $200 item, the quality is still going to be consistent. I'm not going to pick favorites or make your package look better if you pay more kind of a thing. So like the quality is going to be consistent um, no matter if you're a repeat customer or if you're brand new. So those are the, the guidelines for my shop. So for me, the first word um, I use is value is what i'm bringing to you the customer valuable you know i'm taking you you're purchasing something from me but it's valuable your time your money all of those things are valuable so um you know is what i'm offering you does it have value to you the second one is kindness i do everything i do i mean if you follow me you know i lead with kindness in everything i do um you know i work in hr so I deal with a lot of stuff, like people stuff. So everything I do, I do with kindness. So is my interaction with you kind? Is my message kind? Um, if there's a problem, am I responding with kindness? Um, and I find a lot of times, even if there's a problem or a conflict, if you change your mindset and you say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna lead into this being kind, then that like that negative connotation tends to go away and it diffuses the situation just by your tone and how you choose to respond to a situation and then lastly is satisfaction and is that the and that is a, is the customer satisfied from beginning to end um, if the interaction goes well if the interaction doesn't go well are you satisfied as a customer and it can be hard to hear, but I want to know if you're not satisfied mm -hmm. because I want to make it right. Whether that be you choose to never do business with me again, I can move forward and and move on to other interactions with a different perspective. Um, or, you know, just say it means so much to us. If you say, hey, I got my package and I love mm -hmm. it. That changes mm -hmm. like that could change the whole day for me. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you say, hey, I got my box and, you know, something was broken. Um, I don't want to be like, oh, well, sorry. No, what can we do to fix it? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we mm -hmm. fix this? Um, so those are the three words that really come to mind when it comes to my business. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love how all three of us, It's there's a lot of like overlap and it's very similar, but it kind of reflects who we are as people. And um, I also, you know, I think this also shows that there is, there's a really wide spectrum of ways that we can do business. You know, we all do things a little bit differently and we might handle situations differently, but like the underlying values, I think are what is really, really important. Um, so I, I think next, you know, now we're going to kind of walk through Okay, we, we made an outline, but we left a lot of flexibility because mm -hmm. we we're like, the conversation is just going to take us where it's going to take us. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, if you have questions or things, topics you want us to actually address, you can use the little um, question mark bubble down at the bottom of the screen, the bottom right hand corner, and you can put uh, questions in there and that will help us keep track of, keep track of them. Uh, so, you know, kind of moving in customer service, right? We've, we've talked about customer service, customer satisfaction, all of this, but like, how do we actually put that into play? And one of the things that I have always found to be incredibly important is to like set up very clear expectations from the very beginning. What can the customer expect from me? What I expect from them? 
and have it very clear, kind of like shop rules, shop guidelines. I know a lot of people will post these on their profile, which I think is really helpful. Um, you know, but how do you guys make sure that your customers know what to expect from you and what you expect from them when it comes to terms of like payment and communication? Um, go so for me, yeah, sure. I have shop rules on my page. Um, and this came up earlier this week. Um, so I have shop rules on my page, right? And the business that we're in is a little unique because we kind of, to just all develop our own thing right and it's not like this they're not laws or regulations mm -hmm. that are put into place so we as a business determine what our shop policies are going to be um i truly try to stick to those guidelines but there may be one-offs that that you know those rules will be tweaked one way or another um you know for instance like payment like I'm, I have a policy for payment, but I'm a little lax with that. That's on me, you know, that's on me, but I have to be willing to say, okay, you must follow these rules or I choose to, to sway a little bit to the left or the right, depending upon, you know, things happen. We're human, mm -hmm. um, things come up. So I think that we just need to really be transparent with what our rules are and make sure that they're communicated and that both the customer and us are are doing what's best for each of us and that mm -hmm. like i said it goes back to being satisfied and offering value and doing it with kindness mm -hmm. i agree with all of that <laughs> there's not much to like really expand on um but yeah i do have i think having your shop policies in a place that's easy for people to find is really important so i started out just saving them as a story highlight and i think there's still a story highlight i'd have to double check and then i also have them in like a post format with like behind the um the current monthly calendar which i still have not posted but anyway <laughs> um so it's that way and then also like if someone's a new customer for me I will share that post and say, please refer like reference the shop policies and I'll kind of explain a little bit about everything just because you can't really necessarily assume, right? You, you're not supposed to really assume much, but like you can't assume that these people are looking at your profile. So like if somebody finds me on a live sale and they choose to shop that way, it, it's not I don't think it's really their responsibility to check out my page and read every little thing about it. Like it's my responsibility to say, Hey, I had mentioned open boxes on the live sale. Here's the post that shows you what exactly that entails for my shop. Because everybody, like Candace said, everybody's shop is a little bit different. Their policies are a little bit different. So I think just following up and making sure that your policies are like transparent for everybody to see and for people to um view easily is really important mm -hmm. can i just say yeah. something i think it's okay to tweak them too like things mm -hmm. change like things that that i started three years ago are are very different because i've grown so much mm -hmm. so things are allowed mm -hmm. to change and you're allowed to tweak those rules and those policies you the whole thing here is communication i think everything we do goes back to communicating as long as you're communicating to the customer what is happening you know then it's not it's not a bad thing you just have to be transparent with what you're doing mm -hmm. okay. all right so i have and man it's so hard to te tease apart like what we talk about when because it's all so interconnected right but i'll tell you i did some very casual polls and question boxes in my stories the past few days asking customers what their perspective was and i tell you communication that was like the number one thing over and over and over again like it how many people were like clear communication is a must i need to hear from shops like it's crazy how they will buy something send money and not hear something for a month and have no idea when their package is coming they've because nothing has been communicated to them about what to expect you know i have an email that goes out um just a note guys if you're commenting youtube to get the replay it all has to be one word 
um, just how it is in the the pinned comment, just just in case you don't get the DM, that's why. Make sure it's all one word, no space between YouTube. That's how you can get the replay um, afterwards and all the other episodes for YouTube. Anyway, um, um, but it's just like in my, when I have live sales and in my um, website orders, you know, it says in there, your item will be shipped in three to five business days. That is my average um, shipping time. And if it ever gets extended for any reason, I am emailing everyone and telling them when I went on vacation um, last month, it was posted everywhere, like website, Instagram, confirmation, email, everything. And whenever I got an order on Etsy or on my website, I immediately went in and messaged to them directly, hey, did you see this? Mm-hmm. You know, I had one or two Etsy's person and they're like, oh yeah, oh, I did it, but that's fine, right? But if they hadn't seen it, it doesn't matter that Etsy, the shipping times were pushed out one to two weeks. They didn't, they didn't, they just weren't paying attention, you know, and they could have been there like, yeah, we have to over communicate, I feel to our customers, like over, over the top, be respectful, you know, be very clear, use capitalized letters and punctuations in their appropriate Mm -hmm. place, right? Like it's just be professional. I think most of us, um, okay, this is Whitney being blunt. There's this weird space that some sellers, and I, and I totally get this because, um, yeah, and someone, sorry, I'm reading the comments. Someone said, I claimed and went, but went month went by with nothing. Thankfully, I messaged. She was sweet and said she was busy, sick, etc. Okay. I, life gets crazy. Yeah, but you can't exactly. And then she said, upfront communication would have assured me. You can't tell me you were on your phone for a month. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're on your phone. It takes about 10 seconds to say, if you have multiple customers, you copy and paste. Hello, friend. I am sick. You know? <laughs> We'll just make it clear anyways but then you know i think so many of us started this gig as a side thing or whether we're working full-time or we're moms at home we're doing it for fun we're doing it for a little bit of extra cash like i'm just doing it, doing it for fun but now i've been doing this for three years and i'm doing weekly drops you know and so i'm trying to position myself as a business but then i have trouble maintaining professional high standards that people have come to expect from me because of how my profile appears on Instagram. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So we kind of get stuck in this like weird place where we can't, we can't really use the excuse anymore. Like, Oh, it's not really a business. I'm just doing this for fun. I'm not Amazon. Like I totally understand where that's coming from, but that is not how your customers are perceiving you anymore. And so, so I think that's the biggest thing was wanting to bring in the customer perspective about, um, um, how they experience it when things do go wrong. So uh, what are some things, I mean, one big thing that we can talk about is items that are damaged in shipping. Um, Cause there seems to be, uh, there's no playbook for this kind of thing, you know? And so how do you guys handle it when things get broken during shipping? Cause I feel like that is like a big test for our integrity in a shop and how we handle ourselves with customers. That's a big one. Well, I think if somebody is buying something for me, they're trusting that I'm going to package it well so that it won't get broken. Um, But you can, there's only so much you can do. I mean, sometimes things will fall off the truck or uh, they'll get stomped on, like something happened with Candace from someone whose footprint was on the box. Um, but things like things happen. So like, you can only do as much as you can. Like I'm going to pack the items as well as I possibly can to make sure that they get to you safely, but things do happen. So as an, as a business owner, I have to assume responsibility for those things. So I will give a full refund to the person immediately. And I just ask, and I have that in my blurb, um, in my policies, but if you do receive something that's damaged, Please, please, please keep everything. So I'm going to need pictures of your of the box. I need a picture of the label. I need a picture of the packing material, the broken item. Pretty much everything as like evidence because that's what I need to submit to file a claim. Now, mm-hmm. I haven't had any issues with in a while. <laughs> Knock on all wood. <laughs> but um, I think from what I've understood is the post office is a little bit 
different now. So I think the customer has to actually go and go to the post office physically with the item. But when it comes to like UPS, I will go ahead and submit on your behalf. But if they don't refund me, well, oh well, but I want to make sure that you're at least refunded for your item that was damaged and for shipping. Um, and all of my packages are fully insured. So if you buy something that is $30 or if you buy something that's $300, like insurance will cover the entire cost of your package. Mm -hmm. Candice, how do you? Yeah, um, so I thankfully, I mean, I know it's partly my packaging, but <laughs> I've only had two things broken ever. And the one was my very first sale ever, and I had no idea what I was doing. I'm being completely transparent. And, <laughs> and then the second one, I mean, the customer was like, Candace, you could have packed an infant and it would have gotten here safely. Like, clearly it was stomped on, it was dropped, whatever. So um, I usually file a claim for them in pirate ship, but the, like Nicole said, the post office is getting um, very strict with claims. So they are now putting it back on the customer. So the customer has to take the items. Pirate ship will still help you. And they sometimes they will do it. Sometimes they won't. It depends. Um, but if the customer has the issue, they have to take everything to the post office. Um, and then, but I will refund immediately, like Nicole said. I mean, I sent the item, whether it was my fault or not that it was broken in transit. It's my responsibility that the customer is satisfied and that they get a full refund. And I also mm -hmm. include a refund for shipping, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Because why should they have to pay for shipping if they have an item they can't use? Right. Right. So they get yeah. the whole thing. And you can, uh, when I do my, um, you can add extra insurance on pirate ship. Like Nicole said, if you have something that's three hundred dollars and it only comes with a hundred, uh, you know, you can add additional postage. I always include the postage amount because then if there is a claim, they'll cover the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And we and we're getting some comments here from people, you know, that only refund if they get reimbursed. Oh, this is oh no S Broad sixty two. I really like this comment. Um, some people will only refund if they get reimbursed. I don't think that's fair. The seller has the money and the buyer has a broken item. And I have seen shop policies where they say, basically, if anything gets broken, it's on you. It's, it's, you have to deal with it. You have to file it, et cetera. And I do think that, like, I agree totally. It is the past two times. I mean, it's been like twice in a year and a half or two years and items that were damaged. It was my fault. Like it just flat out was. Um, either I didn't wrap something in cardboard that should have. The other time was, it, it just, it wasn't proper packaging and refund it right away. I did file a claim and then they did ask, you know, the post office is like, you need to take it in. And I'm like, I'm not gonna make my customer take that in because honestly it was my fault, <laughs> you know, but if it was something where the outer package was clearly damaged, you know, then I would ask for them. And the biggest thing guys though, is prevention. Prevention mm -hmm. is better than the cure. It's easier and it's cheaper. And we have episode, uh, five on shop talk episode five we did like a two three hour shop talk all about shipping tips we actually showed you our shipping supplies we wrap things we do everything we can um you know what is it an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound i don't know there's a lot of cliches about there because it's so important it's just keep prevent it from ever happening go overboard and package more than you need to um so I go a little crazy. And this is also another reason I do use, I use recycled boxes, but if it's flimsy and thin or it's already been kind of busted up, like I just use my new boxes. It's just not worth it. So. Um, yeah, especially uh, for well, fragile items. Yeah. Definitely get like a thicker walled box because you can add all the peanuts and all the packing paper you want. But if something smashes in the side of a box and breaks it, then you're, that's it. So, so this is a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Candace. I, no, I, I did put just, up a question here. I was just going to say um, that there have been many times, like I've boxed something, right? And I'm like, moved on to the next one. And I'm like, nope, I'm mm -hmm. not comfortable with that. I am not comfortable with the room at the top or the, and I'll mm -hmm. unbox it. That mm -hmm. like, 
like you said, prevention is so much easier. So, so what? It takes me an extra 15 minutes to find a bigger box because I would much rather get there than have to go back and say, oh, now, you know, now the customer has to do a refund, you know, has to do a claim and that it just, prevention is so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, the fragile sticker means nothing. I'm just used the honestly, mm -hmm. I just use the fragile stickers to cover up um, old stickers from the first time the box was used. <laughs> okay. Someone asked a really, really good question, which I think this is, this is good because now we're getting in the weeds. What if the customer refuses to take pictures and refuses to send, they just say it's broken and they don't send pictures. Um, that is a great, great question because 99 point, just like for sellers, right? 99.999% of sellers and buyers are fabulous. But occasionally we do have some people that, um, I hear more about it with Etsy is, uh, personally for me, if a customer is saying something is broken, this has never happened, but if they say it's broken, but they're refusing to document it with photos, then I would just tell them, I can't refund unless I see photos of the item. I think that that's fair. Yes. We are respecting our customers and we're also going to ask it, asking them to respect us, our time and money at the same time. And I think that that's fair, right? It's definitely fair. I mean, with any other company. So like I've had things arrive damaged from place. I mean, I don't shop there anymore, but I've had things damaged from like Wayfair, right? So I submitted a claim and they want proof. I mean, who's to say that I'm just not like, oh, I want my money back. I like the item, but it was too expensive. They're not going to care. They're a big company. No, <laughs> you can't do that. So they always expect a photo as yeah. proof that the item is damaged and then they'll issue a refund. If someone doesn't want to give me a photo, then we can't. This goes down to like basic principles, I think. Like you can't trust everybody right off the bat. So like you're learning to trust me because you don't know me. You're hoping that my word is true and that I'm going to follow through with everything that I'm saying. But I'm also trusting you that you're going to be honest on the recipient end mm -hmm. that if you say there's not item damaged and you're not going to send a picture, then I have nothing to go off of. I don't know you. Like, I don't know you. So how am I supposed to trust you? It's like, it's a two-way street. Okay. Someone at someone, I'm reading comments and I, t I totally agree, Nicole. Um, someone said she received a broken package. Hold on. Cherish Vintage, I'm reading your, you ever, ever had two things break? Oh, you sent it. Sorry. You sent it and someone asked for a refund four months after the package had been sent. No, I mean, mm -hmm. four months. No, um, no, I even, this is also interesting. I'm reading the comments as in, yes, integrity is a two way street. Also, um, Ash mentioned that you need a photo for backup for write offs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, I have the same little wording in my packing slips. Like if you're, this literally says this in my packing slip of every package that gets sent out, it says, okay, you guys are gonna have to watch the comments and make sure we <laughs> cover everything. There's so, this is amazing. I love the discussion everyone's having. Uh, anyway, and it says, save your items, save the packaging, email me right away if anything comes back damaged. One time I had, I sold a quilt top. This was a couple of years ago. I sold a quilt top on um, Etsy and heard nothing about them for like six weeks, two months. I don't know. And my, and I have no returns. My, I have a no return policy, but obviously if someone is really upset, then they, then please communicate with me. I want to make you happy. This woman, six to eight weeks after she received my item, left a one star review in my Etsy and said the colors weren't like what she thought and it smelled like mouse pee. <sighs> I was just like, what? Six weeks, you never messaged me. You never said anything to me the minute you got it. How do I know that you haven't stored it in a closet for six weeks and a mouse did pee mm -hmm. on it? And right. so I posted a very polite, but very firm response. I was like, seller did not, you know, or the buyer did not contact me. She did not send me photos. She did not tell me any of these things. Like if you're truly unhappy, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to work with it, work with you. But I can't guarantee that in six um, weeks, you haven't ruined it, you know, especially for textiles. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any recourse you ladies know for a buyer who pays hundreds of dollars, but never receives a merchandise and cannot get a response? 
And that right there is why you as buyers should not, I'm just going to say it, why you should not use friends and family or Venmo unless it has goods and services coverage. I mean, I hate that we're at that point, but unfortunately, if that buyer was required to use that, they have absolutely no protection. I, this is a very unpopular thing that I say. Um, and I feel so bad for that buyer because if you used PayPal business or Venmo goods and services or Shopify, if you can try to reverse the charges on your credit card, but you have absolutely no protection. It just totally depends on how they purchased, you know, you could contact your, your credit card company, but yeah. Um, so, so yeah, what, I don't even know what we were talking about when I kind of went off on that team. Um, you were oh, oh, talking like, about like length of time when someone yeah. texts you. It's funny you say that because I, you know, we just went through a home remodel and I literally didn't open boxes for two months. I'm just being transparent here because I didn't, I'm not gonna, if something is broken, I'm not gonna reach out to the buyer now and say, oh, guess what? Uh, you sent this in April and it's June and now it's broken. No, that was my, I didn't open it right away. So it's, it's my loss, I guess, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, there's a lot Wait. coming through. I know, sorry guys, You. this is awesome. The seller should not have to pay those fees. This offers the buyer. I mean, that I pay the fee. I mean, I pay. Here's the thing. I'm reading comments. You're being, You're being professional, right? And it's a business. It's Any a other business to do business. For they pay for the fee for to own a booth. They pay for the fee to own the store. They pay the credit card transaction fee when somebody buys stuff. You should pay your business if you're trying to be professional and you want to be respected by everyone. I honestly, and I'm sorry if this like pulls any, pushes any buttons, but I think you should have to pay a fee. Everybody else does. Yeah. I don't know. It's, what me. Sorry. Just work, put oh it, God. you need to just, in, you know what? Increase your prices by 5%. Done. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's right. all you need to do guys. Fee. That's all your, you need to do. 5%. Or put it on a handle. Someone said, you know, handling fee, that's fine. But I I do not, if paying 5%, yes, credit card fees, do you, every yeah. time you swipe your fee, do you know that those businesses are paying 3%? This is why when you go to small town America, a lot of antique stores charge you, the buyer, that 3%. That's why I always carry cash and check. I pay, I use more checks now as an antique dealer than, um, I ever did in my life 20 years ago. But I mean, if your business cannot sustain a 5% user fee, you need to, yes, anyone can see this live. Um, you need to reconfigure your business structure. You, you, your business should be able to sustain that kind of expense. Okay, guys. Um, yeah, this is, this is like I said, we're just going to be super, super blunt with you and honest. And this is not just coming from us. This is talking with a lot of long term. I, I know a lot of dealers who've been doing this off Instagram for 30 years and doing a lot of things. And I, I run situations by them sometimes and they're like, this is this is amazing. OK, so hopefully, like I said, you guys are hearing from customer perspective, like what I want to bring it back. This is just not things that we're like coming up with on the top of our heads. This is literally what customers are telling us they want from sellers. This is what customers want from us. So I always come back to that. If you were a customer, what would you want to happen? So, and I do whatever you can. Yes. If you choose, and that's the thing as a seller, you're going to do everything you can to make them happy. That, that is the main thing. And I think both of those two, it's like making sure. And sometimes, um, sorry, I'm reading, uh, I, golly, the horror stories. Okay, guys, we're going to, we're, okay. Oh, look what our next topic is actually interactions with other shops and how to publicly talk about other sellers. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> Like I said, 99.99% .99 of sellers and buyers and people out there are fabulous. Um, and we also, 
So uh, just as we sellers want to be respectful towards buyers, we also want to be respectful towards other shops because dang it, I have not really seen or experienced this within the vintage world, but I have seen the damage that social media can do um, because I've just, see, I've seen things. And one of the things, you know, when we talk about, about our, our business values, like I said, one of mine is respect. I want to respect other sellers and I want to respect um, how they run their shops, you know, and not speak ill of other sellers at all. And one thing too that I thought was really helpful is when you as other sellers are thinking about who to work with, it's really important to work with businesses whose values align with yours. So I'm talking the, all the things that we've been talking about, like if you have someone that you're asked to do a live sale with, or, you know, to do a joint anything with, where your names are going to be together and you're working together in any capacity, it is worthwhile to ask them, okay, what are your policies? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? Because when you do live sales together, especially the people, they start to see you as like, the thing one thing like you are a reflection upon one another and it's really important for you to ask those questions like is this someone whose values align with me how, how do you guys um think about that or approach approach that so, so i get asked because I, I do 95 percent of my sales are live sales i get asked at least 10 times a week to do a live sale with someone so, and I don't mean to say this in a negative way, but if you just send me a message that says, can I get on your live sale schedule? I don't even know your name. Like you need to, you know, there needs to be some rapport there. Mm -hmm. I need to know yeah. what your shop policies are. I need to know that you're, because if I'm willing to share my customers with you, then I need mm -hmm. to, like Whitney said, I need to make sure that your values and your business aligns with my values and my business. Because if I'm willing to go on a live sale with my customers who trust and respect me, and I say, here, everyone, this is so-and-so from so-and-so, and they do all of the things wrong or the other way, now my name is tarnished. They're, they're going to lose respect mm -hmm. and trust for me, mm -hmm. and it just creates a bigger problem. So it's not... <laughs> I don't like I, I really feel bad when people ask me because I would love to do a live sale with everyone, but I can't, I can't one because of time and two, mm -hmm. I need to make sure that they align. And I'm not saying they don't align with my values and my business, but I'm just not willing to do a live with just anyone. Um, because there needs to, to be that trust there. You need to know that they're going to do the right thing for the customer. Um, mm -hmm. also, and also there is, something to be said for like having a relationship with another seller you know the live goes better if you have something in common or you've talked in the past or you know if you're just hopping on a live sale with someone else sometimes that can get really um hard to participate in because you may not mm -hmm. have anything in common you don't know each other mm -hmm. and then it just becomes like this i have this i have it there's no like camaraderie there so um, I, I always go back to remind myself that this is my business. Mm -hmm. I pay taxes. I have a business license. This is my business. And I choose to do business with the people that I know and trust and that run their shops the way that I run my shop. And that I can say, hey, I know how Whitney ships. I know her timelines. I know how she treats customers. I know, how, I know Nicole's shop. I trust them and I am willing to do sales with them. And that doesn't come overnight. And it doesn't mean I won't do a live sale with a new person or someone I don't know, but I really have to think long and hard about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I've received, I've received several messages from people asking to do live sales with me. And it's hard because like when you're typing things out and you have to think of like how someone's going to read your response. And I never want to sound like it's never like intended to be 
disrespectful or as like an insult to the person who's asking. But so I came up with a like a pretty polite response and just basically it's just in the interest of my customers. I only sell with people I have a relationship with and who I can trust because basically agreeing to sell alongside someone is telling my viewers and my customers that they're in good hands with this other seller. And if I can't validate this person, I can't verify that they follow through with sales, that they're good with communication, that their, their items are quality. If I don't even know, like Candace says, I don't even know your first name. I don't know your shop. How am I going to agree to, and I don't think it matters how many customers you have. If you have like 10 customers or if you have 300 customers, you should still want to protect them. You don't, I never ever want to like sell with someone blind pretty much and not know how they conduct their shop and not know what their policies are. And then I have someone who trusts me get really upset with the quality of an order that they placed with someone who I sold with. I don't want to associate myself with somebody. And this honestly, and it has nothing to do with new sellers. It has nothing to do with because we were all once there right we all didn't know how to pack things we all didn't know how shipping worked we're moving forward and it has nothing to do with you as a person it, please never take it personally the best comparison i can do is when you are say you're an influencer and you are um asked to do a collaboration with a company i had done one in the past a company said hey would, if we send you a free product, can you write an ad and, um, and promote us on your social media page? If I don't know what that company is, I'm not going to agree to it. And I did it one time. I agreed to do it with this one company. They sent me free pillows. And I was like, okay, I'll do an ad on the pillows. Like, I was so, like, so excited. I was like, wow, they actually chose me. I only had, like, 2,000 followers. No. The quality wasn't good. I don't want my friend, like, I don't want my friends and everybody viewing me is a friend, honestly. Like, I, if you are taking the time out to watch me, I think, I think of you all very highly. So I wouldn't want to go on there and just because I'm getting an item for free, be like, hey, this is a quality item. You should definitely buy it if I can't vouch for that item. So the same thing with doing business with businesses it has nothing to do with you as a person i just don't know you i don't know your business and i don't know if i feel comfortable recommending you to my customers that's it rent over <laughs> oh my god i just had to post something in all caps because I and it's not personal. I mean, it's not personal. I mean, it's not personal. It's not personal. It's not personal. It's not personal. It has nothing to right. do with you as a person. It's just. Uh -huh. Yep. And it's yep. not like if it, it's it not has, because you're new. It's not. You could have 4 million followers. It has nothing to do mm -hmm. with follower count yeah. or when you started your shop. It's just having respect for your business and your customers. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's I. There have been people that have asked, and I have said yes because maybe I have purchased for them, or I've heard really good things about them. And you know, yeah. I absolutely will. But it's not. I don't want ever ever want anyone to think it's personal because it's not. This is, at the end of the day, I think our community is so tight knit that a lot of feelings get hurt because they think that we should all just sing, you know, kumbaya and, you know play cards or something together but at the end of the day this is a business so you know you have to treat it like that and when you respect your business that way it you know it shows and then those people are willing to to trust you also mm -hmm. okay i i mean i have two i have two things to say well actually one because i i forgot the first one already <laughs> <laughs> My brain is exploding. I'm like screaming inside. Yes. Yes. Okay. Actually, I remember the first one. Our egos have to get out of the way. Our egos have to literally just, just go away. You have got, and I'm so sorry, cherish vintage is sharing. That's about being like someone being really disrespectful during a live sale. Your, your ego has to get out the door 
there are three things in life that will completely strip you down to your raw person, the core of your being and like bring out all the junk. It's, it's marriage, parenting and owning your own business. I tell you what, and I have, I, you know, I have all three, so I need lots of therapy, but I, it really does bring up and it's like, you have got to get your ego out of the way and do what is best for them. Not for, I mean, what is best for the customer will in the end be the best for your reputation reputation. The other thing I have to say, and I, I could scream this from the top of my lungs all day long, just because someone has a large Instagram following does not mean they're a good business. It just means they're really good at Instagram. Yeah that now so there is this bias and i've heard it called visibility bias and i deal with it all day long because people see oh my gosh she has almost thirty thousand followers she must really know what she's doing oh do you know thirty whitney and the and people i go and i'm not saying this to, to my own horn but i'm saying i've experienced this and i see through it because i have had insta fame before and then had it completely destroyed and a completely different business venture. So I'm very, I'm a little cynical. I'm very thick skinned and I'm just like, yeah, it's like, it's really not a thing, but I will go places and oh my God, Thrifty Whitney, I know you. And I'm like, the only reason you know who I am is I posted some really good reels. That is the <laughs> only reason. It doesn't mean that I know what I'm doing. It doesn't mean I know antiques. It doesn't mean I have ethics. You know, I, now on the flip side, I do work really hard to make Instagram a positive experience for people to bring them in, to do education, to do all these things. But if, but I have seen accounts and I've heard even today in today's comments, we've heard, oh, they were big hitters. They were big sellers. What does that mean? They have 50,000 followers. They, they're really good at photography mm -hmm. and like putting clips together and showing antiques and like smiling. I'm, I'm there. I know I'm being super cynical about it, but I'm, what I'm trying to also is like help you guys understand that I think social media has, and I was just talking to two different dealers, one who works at a local antique, he's the general man manager for a local antique mall. And I was talking to an art dealer who also is local. And um, it's like, they're talking about the way that social media has kind of like twisted our ability to run ethical businesses. And it was very, very, very interesting, um, you know, and I think that's something that I did want to kind of address was like acknowledging the potential pitfalls that social media can play and how we run ethical businesses and how we sell with integrity, you know, and just how that maybe some of the, I do think that social media pr provides a bajillion amazing opportunities. And I also think that it facilitates some bad behavior because it'll generate traffic to our Instagrams. What do you, is that resonating with, with you two as far as like things that, ways that we have to navigate um, the social media space when we're selling antiques? Mm -hmm. As we're on Instagram talking about this. <laughs> um, it's hard yeah. because it's, mm -hmm. it's a social media mm -hmm. platform that we have chosen to use to sell our wares, to sell our antiques and vintage items. And it's hard to not, not get caught up in the friendship side of things, the social side of things. Mm. And I think, like you said, Whitney, I think people take things personally. And it, like you can be, you can have a row of businesses, right? In a little strip mall. And you may not know one of them because you each do your own thing. That doesn't mean that they're not a good business. It doesn't mean they're a bad business. You just don't interact with them because you're doing your own business. Mm -hmm. When we're on this platform, it's so easy because we're so tight knit to, to feel bad if you don't want to sell with someone. Like it, it, the social side of things makes it difficult. Um, but I think, like you said, if you take the ego out of it, you take the personal side out of it. Um, it, it makes things a little bit easier to swallow. I mean, there have been times, like I see people collaborate and I'm like, it, it's human nature to be like, oh, why wasn't I asked? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's just, it's just the human side of things. Um, mm -hmm. But if you remove that and think of it as a business and you can still be kind, that doesn't mean you have to be nasty. If you can be kind and, and just say, hey, 
I'm not, I'm not doing any live sales with new people, right? You know, with an, anyone new with, mm -hmm. and not new shops. I mean, I'm not taking on any new lives this month or just be kind. It just be kind. And that just adds so, so much value to how, again, how you present yourself and how your business is portrayed. Mm -hmm. I, I, one of the things also, you know, more, this is probably a little bit more practically, um, is like someone, someone had asked, especially for protocol during live sales, like what we do when, um, sorry, I'm reading comments. So, you know, how do we handle it when customers like claiming ghost? Or they, you know, especially on live sales, this is a thing. And I've, I think this is a worthy topic to explore because I've seen a wide range of responses to where like, well, if they don't pay, it's, they just kind of let it go and I just move on. Or some people are like, if you don't pay me within 24, I've, well, I hear this from customers because they'll message me and they're like, I can't get it to work. Please don't block me. Please, I'm trying. I promise. I promise. I promise. And they're like, totally panicked. I'm like, dude, like, chill. <laughs> um, and so, oh my gosh, sorry. I, someone asked about ship time because she'd taken two weeks and still hadn't shipped and she refunded me and blocked me. Oh. For the love, sorry. So um, anyway, so we have this like wide variation of people who are like block, just block them, you know? And then, and then there's a lot of people that kind of fall somewhere in between. And so this is kind of connected to social media and customer service. It's like, how do we navigate those situations where we just want to get paid? <laughs> and because, yeah, go ahead. I think, it's, I mean, it has to do with your shop. Pol we go back to the shop mm -hmm. policy. So like depending on, like, I think Whitney had once told me that there was someone who um, wanted to get paid within like an hour or something like that. But like, then there are people that like, I say within 24 hours, but I don't hold it against somebody if they take a little bit longer. Now, if there are backups on that item, then yes, I'll reach out and say, hey, I haven't noticed payment. Please let me know if something came up or whatever. I have a few other people interested. Because I think then that's being respectful of the backups too. Like you're not waiting mm -hmm. two, three days to, for payment from the one person if there are people in line behind them. But things do happen. There could be a family emergency, maybe your internet's down or I don't know, something happened where you can't pay on your phone type thing. But if, if I reach out to somebody and I say, hey, your invoice has been sent and I usually send a link, if they're, if they're new, I'll send a link to the invoice. And if, okay, the question you through, what is a ghost buyer? It's basically someone who just doesn't respond anymore. So like the term like ghosted, like if they're there one minute and then they go away and they never come back kind of a thing, like they just vanish. They claim something during, like they claim something on an Instagram sale, but then they they don't res respond to it, request for payment. So if I reach out to somebody three times and they still haven't responded, then I'm just going to move on. Mm -hmm. But if there is a backup, I will definitely move on faster than that. Yeah. But it, it does happen. I mean, if we've never interacted before, and this goes for anybody, if we've never interacted before, and I send you a message most likely it's going to end up in your message requests folder. So maybe people don't know that they have a message request folder. Just explore mm -hmm. your DM mm -hmm. because there are a couple tabs at the top. There's like, was it primary, general, and message requests, I think. Mm -hmm. there, there will be requests in there. So that's why a lot of times we say, like if you are a new buyer to any of us, please send us a message because then our message won't be stuck in your request folder and then you'll miss out on the item because you you didn't think to check there or you didn't know that that folder even exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything, Candace? No, I think Nicole covered yeah. that well. Yeah. Um, That's a good question. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, Lauren asked, like, how do you communicate if someone goes with you twice and then continues to DM you? So, um, first mm -hmm. off, I will probably never block someone unless they're trying to do active harm to me in my account. I kind of like keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer. Or if you see yourself as my enemy, I kind of want to see what you're doing to make sure that you're not bad mouthing me. So 
I'll probably never block. Like, I don't want to ever block anyone. But I did have someone who claimed an item. Oh, yes. And then Ash, that yes. Next is Ash's question. What if they do pay and they don't pick up if they're local? That's a, that's a great one. Um, which is kind of like a very special question for local people. But anyway, so I had someone who claimed something on a live sale, completely ghosted me, never responded. But I had sent them an invoice and I had their email address in Shopify. Month later, they claim something else. Um, and But it's with a completely different Instagram handle. But they give me the same email address. And then she's like, like, hey, I actually can't pay for this for another four days. Can you hold it for me? So as I put her email address into my system, I'm like, oh, you ghosted me like a month ago. So I messaged her. And I said very clearly, hey, I, I didn't say ghost but I use nicer words, but I said, Hey, you ghosted me like a month ago. And now you're asking me to hold, I expect payment by May 30th. If you're, if you don't pay this invoice on time, I just won't allow you to buy any, um, to claim anything during live sales. Like if I see your name pop up in a live sale, I am not going to acknowledge your claim, but I'm not going to block you because you might buy something from my way. I have people who, <laughs> I have someone who has claimed something in a live sale, but they purchased, they continue to purchase from my website. I'm like, well, I mean, I'm probably going to ignore your claim during a live sale, but if you want to keep buying from my website, that's fine with me. Actually, that's why I love, okay. If, if you're expecting people to pay you within like 15 minutes or an hour, that's when you just need to get a website. Cause that's what they do. They pay right away. It's the best thing ever. It's amazing. Um, and then someone also asked like ghost buyers who do pay and then don't pick up. So Ash, what I would recommend, cause I kind of ran into this also with some, when I first started selling, I was doing a lot of local pickup orders, like a ton. And I kind of told people like, you need to pick it up within two weeks. And then if they couldn't make it down, I'd push it out to four. But once it got past four weeks, I'd be like, you have five days to pick this up or I am putting it back in my shop. And I'm, I'm, I mean, you can decide whether you want to refund them the money or not. You could refund them minus like a $15 restocking fee. But if you're having that as a problem, here's the thing with policies, like proactively deal with it by making a policy and sticking with it and making sure that everyone knows about it and implementing it. Just like with toddlers, you have to do what you say or else they're not going to take you seriously. And the same goes with like, so I do open boxes and after um, the sale, I'll invoice for the item to one, it ensures that you're really serious about your purchase and it's not just going to sit on my shelf for like three weeks and then you decide you don't want it anymore because that's happened before and that's kind of what made me invoice after every sale. Um, and then at the end of the month or like a couple weeks later, I'll be like, hey, I have all of your items packed up and they're ready to go. I'm closing all open boxes and then they don't respond to the shipping invoice. So like whether it's a local pickup or you're ready to ship, I think the same thing applies with what Whitney was saying is you need to have some sort of like a time frame or you have to have some policy in mind that like what happens if someone pays for their purchase, like they pay for their items through the whole month. And then at the end of the month when shipping comes around and it could be like $10, I'm not saying it's anything astronomical, then they don't pay the shipping invoice. Then what do you do? So it's just like things to like consider that's happened with me one time and I was very persistent and I messaged that person every day and I felt like I was nagging them. But I mean, they had spent a decent amount of money with me and mm -hmm. shipping, I think was like $9 or something because they were not very far. So nag, if you have to, I mean, I don't, I would, someone, I, would, yeah. I would hate for someone to like miss out on their items and have to like unpack everything and then have to try to resell it again. Like that, that's a big inconvenience. Mm -mm. Yeah, I totally agree. So really the thing, like make a policy, stick with it. Um, and, and Ash, get those people, you email all those people and you tell them three days, you come and get your stuff or it like, that's, I can't, why don't they want it? That's amazing. Okay. Um, I think next on our, list. I, I, it's so interesting because I think that we have really covered a lot of the things that I kind of took down from the question box for customers that I wrote down. Like, what do customers want? And, you know, we've actually talk, talked about shipping, but I, this is, this, I just thought this was very, this, this very interesting statistic 
um, that's very, you know, from a very, very small pool of people responding to my polls on Instagram stories. I don't know how, how scientific that is. 70%, when I asked, I asked the question, what is it to you? Because a lot of people were like, I just want to get my item within a reasonable amount of time. And I asked them, what is reasonable mean to you? Like, how long do you think is reasonable to expect your item to be shipped out to you? Not to arrive on your door, but like what time frame? 70% of people said they expect their item to be shipped out within a week. I thought that was really interesting because I think I see a lot of longer shipping times. And again, it's not so much the shipping time. I mean, I would say like a month is completely unreasonable unless you're holding an open box. You know what I mean? Like obviously there's contingencies of like, no, I want my open box for this month. Like the customer actually is telling you that's what they want. That's different. But 70% of people who responded in that poll said that they, ex they thought a reasonable time was within a week. After that, I think it was, where did that picture go? Um, 70, 26% uh, said within one to two weeks, 4% said three weeks. What was interesting though, most of the people, cause I can go through and see who responded to the polls. Most of the people who responded one to two weeks were shops. And I think we have this inner empathy, like, right. We feel a little bit more like we understand how hard it is. We understand the work and everything. So we're much more willing to be gracious and empathetic and like, oh, you can take longer. It's fine. Cause we you know, we know what it's like. So really the majority of customers that were responding, the vast majority ex really did expect their items to be shipped out within a week. I just thought that was. I think that's a reasonable time frame, yeah. though. I mean, most other businesses are three to five business days, so why mm -hmm. can't yours be? And if it isn't, then you just have to be upfront and say that mm -hmm. it's going to take seven to ten business days because maybe you do work or maybe you're home full time with your kids or you care for um, a family member and you're only allowed a certain amount of days to um, dedicate to like shop work. But I think, I mean, I don't. I don't think it's asking too much to do it within a week but personally yeah. like when i purchase something from another shop i'll say like hey like i'm in no rush to get this so put me at the end of your list but i don't think if someone doesn't say that i don't think you should necessarily be like oh well they haven't asked about my their order so let me just push it off for another week like that mm -hmm. that goes back to integrity <laughs> and how you want to be portrayed yeah. Now I'm laughing because my friend Cinda said, I was the one who accidentally hit three weeks. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's well sad. Um, the other thing, the other things that were kind of on this were, you know, customers want fair pricing. They want you to do what you say you would do. They don't want you to undercut or bash other shops. That's something that I, uh, I forgot to mention during the live sales of something, which I, I get it. You, you wanting to give people a good bargain, but when you say, I see other people sell this for like twice as much or three times as much, it, you know, what I've seen other sellers say these kinds of things. And I know the intention is to be like, Hey, this is a great value. I'm doing this for a customer, but it is kind of comes across as like not great because then it puts in, what it does is it puts in the customer's mind, like, Oh, this other shop is charging me too much. I just bought something from, I just bought something for $30 from this other girl and, and this now she's charging 15. That other girl's ripping me off. Like, oh man, I just got, you know what, you know, do you see where it goes? Mm -hmm. It's like, right. And I don't see this all the time, but it's like, it kind of leaves a sour taste in my mouth as a seller. Am I off or mm -hmm. am I? I had a conversation with a friend on here about that. And she had asked me like, Hey, I'm selling a similar item to you. I know you typically charge like $20 for this item. I'm just looking to get rid of them. So like I'm selling them a lot lower. So like it was more of like a heads up type of thing. And I've seen other times where say like tomato spoons. Okay guys, like, cause I sell a lot of silver plate. So like I have a decent, I guess range of what I sell per type of um, item and condition and things like that. So when I see someone selling a tomato spoon for like $12 and meanwhile I'm selling it for like 26, then it makes it look like I'm just greedy and I want your money. 
but the value of it is like I'm more in the appropriate like bracket I guess of like what they actually go for so like because someone's discounting their item it kind of reduces the value of the item and then it makes it's a bad reflection on me because then it makes it look like if they're used to those prices and then they look at my shop and they're like oh my goodness vintage haven charges an arm and a leg for this mm -hmm. then it's mm -hmm. like a sticky situation because i don't think i'm charging that much because i see comps that are way up like higher and it is hard especially when people ask me questions i've had a few people ask me questions how do you know how to price things well it's hard because it's there's like a range and you have Mm -hmm. So there's like well, and that's that aspect of it that I'm just like, oh, yeah. I, and I think you're hitting on their key. There's a big range, and sometimes it's not so much the price that's it's, that is the issue. It's more like how people are presenting it when they're selling it, right? Candice, do you have any? They have no idea. I do. <laughs> Do you have, uh, I'm laughing at uh, Cinda's comment. I think, so. you know, I think like for instance, like I know what I am willing to pay for an item. So let's just use tomato spoon. I'm just saying, if I'm willing to not go above $8 for a tomato spoon, it's not in my best interest to sell it for $12. If I pay a dollar for a tomato spoon, maybe I can charge $12. So I think it's not just a, it's not just just like a, a fix all like it there are many different factors that go into your pricing how much mm -hmm. you paid for it how you how you had to acquire it did you have to ship it and pay for shipping um and that's the other thing like there's no set rate like there's not like a guide that says okay everyone charged 12 dollars for a tomato spoon or everyone charged 28 dollars for a tomato spoon i think again i think this goes back to integrity and trust if you're buying from a shop that you know does their research, that knows what they have, that does, you know, that gives you a description and tells you where it's from and gives you the age and all of those things, I think you're well within your right to charge $28 for a tomato spoon because mm -hmm. you're adding value. You're explaining that piece and, you know, adding value to the item you're offering. Um, I think it's hard because we're all over the place. Things cost different amounts at different places. So, you know, people have to source in different locations. So I think all of that comes into play. So I don't think there's like a, mm -hmm. a, a one size fits all. Um, but if you're not comfortable as the customer, paying that amount of money because maybe you don't understand or you at first ask questions and two maybe you do a little bit of research on your end like okay you know what's the like okay when nicole and i do our sales together right when we do a jersey girl sale we talk pricing because i don't want nicole to have a tomato spoon for 28 dollars and i'm selling it for 12 or 60. like i like us to be somewhat in the middle so that way our customers are like okay this is you know, similar item, similar price. If it's off a dollar or two, not, you know, that to me, that's the same price. Um, but I don't think there's like a, a set answer for that because there are mm -hmm. so many factors that come into play when you're pricing an item. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I, I want to pick out a cut because I think this to layer on top of this question, my friend Cinda is down in the comments and Cinda has been doing this for like 30 years. She's sort of one of my antique mentors locally. My mentors would literally, so she's a dealer. So she's talking about being at a show at an antique show. They would literally buy from me, walk 10 feet across to their shop, double the price and get their money for it. Hooray for them. They obviously had the knowledge and confidence to sell it for that price. So, cause I've, I've I think we've established like there are a bajillion factors that go into pricing something but apparently again i kind of hit this nerve unknowingly with the reel i did a few months ago apparently there are some dealers on instagram that don't like it when other dealers buy from them and then resell to their market they think it's unethical and icky and so what are your guys what are your opinions 
on that? Well, it happened early on. And I remember telling Candace about it. I was like, can you believe so-and-so bought these butter pads for me? And then she sold them on her Instagram when she bought them for me on Instagram. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, who cares? If she, she was a good customer to me. She paid me what I asked for, for that item. She has every right to do whatever she pleases with it. If she wants to keep it, if she chooses, she receives it. And she's like, oh, I don't really want to have this in my home. Let me sell it again. Or if she's just buying to sell, if that was the intention when she bought it. As long as I get what I'm asking for the item and I would, um, and she showed respect towards me and we carried on like a conversation or whatever, like we went through with the purchase and I was satisfied with how it worked on my end, she can do whatever she wants with it. And if she wants to sell it for like five times what she bought it for, go right ahead. Because at the end of the day, if I had those listed for say, I don't know, $20 and I got my $20, isn't that like what you look for? Isn't that like the whole purpose? If you're going to sell an item, you receive payment for it, it goes to its destination, then it's up to the recipient, whatever they want to do with it, they can do with it. Mm -hmm. I think the same way I, if I got what I wanted for my item, you can do whatever you want for it. If you want to resell it for $3,000, then that's your prerogative. I mean, I, I got what I wanted for it. Mm -hmm. So if you can get more, you do you and you shoot for the stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll never forget one of the first times I sold a quilt to like an antique quilt to a pretty big, I don't even know what to say, uh, shop up north somewhere, like with a big website presence and all of that. Um, and I, and then she put it on her website for like maybe three times what I had sold it to her for. And I sent her a message and I was honestly being like, Oh, I had no idea the quilt was worth that much. That's awesome. Glad you can get that much. She came back with a very defensive message to me because she, um, thought I was being sarcastic and like actually was mad about it because that's what she had experienced so often in buying from small sellers and then reselling. And I was like, girl, I'm like, this is an educational opportunity for me. And that's what I think if you ever feel that way of like, I can't believe she got it for that much. And she sold it for this much. Like, Hey, you should probably just bump up your prices if you can just a little bit. Um, the other thing too, I just want to point out because someone was like, um, said, Okay, yes, Jennifer says and on average an item gets resold four times before it ends up with the final customer. Yeah. Guys, we are we're pretty low in the totem pole <laughs> for an antique. You know, and it's gonna move up the chain and, and end up somewhere pretty high sometimes. Now there's an issue if the buyer asks for a lower price, then turns around and sells for a much higher price. Okay. This is where it gets really interesting with Instagram antique and the actual antique dealing world because that asking for a trade deal is a thousand times the norm that is absolutely the norm in the antique yeah. dealer world if you're an antique dealer you have every right i just experienced this in my booth i got a call from the mall they said hey dealers are down here from another city near me there's like three or four pieces they're looking at in your booth they're asking for 20 percent off I said, absolutely, yes. Like that's, yes, please do it, sell it, get rid of them. I'm ready to move it, get the inventory out the door. They want a discount, their dealer's great. What are their names? Give them my name, give them my business card. You like my stuff, maybe you'll buy more for me. They gave me their names and I was like, well, I bought from them. I was in their shop and they gave me 20% off. Because the thing, when you are dealers and you are dealing with each other, I know those two guys, I'm going to go in their shop. I'm going to buy stuff and resell it to my customers and my profit will be there. Maybe the profit's 20%, maybe it's 50%. Maybe I double my money, whatever, but maybe it's stuff they want to get rid of and they can come to my store and get that as a dealer, because one thing they're buying in bulk, it's not the same as a customer coming in and do, I hope you got, I'm not even looking at the comments, you know, but I just want to do a little bit of a fact check with people that like, that's very, very much the norm to do trade deals with other dealers because you buy from each other. Someone said three antique mm -hmm. dealers get marooned on an island with a chair and an antique book and they all lived happily ever after. 
because then they spend the rest of their time just doing deals and swapping it back and forth. You want, how about a chair and a coconut? How about a chair, coconut, and this goat that I just killed? Like, anyway. Okay, there are a lot of questions. I just, yes. Every, every there was a comment that like if it bothered somebody that if so, like a dealer asked for a, a discount and then they went and sold it for higher i think it's dependent upon like you don't have to say yes if you want twenty dollars for the item this person's saying i'll pay 16 for it no sorry my prices are firm um or if you just want to like make the sale and discount it I think either, I mean, it depends on how you feel, but I, with me, I, as long as I'm, I'm getting something in return for the, the good that I provide, then mm -hmm. they can sell it for three times more. It doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And, and privately, I do want to say, sorry, I do want to say that I do think to do it in good taste, because someone said, well, I saw this buyer on a live sale. It was a customer. They bought this item. They claimed it before I did. I just wanted it for my house. The dealer got it first. And then next week I saw on her Instagram for twice as much. I do. Mm -hmm. So that left the, again, then the perspective of the customer is key. And I'm like, whoa, I can totally see why that would kind of leave you with a bad taste of your mouth towards that dealer. So I do recommend do your trade deals in private. If it's a big piece, like if you're buying something for $500 and you want it fresh to the market, ask that dealer, can you take your photos off Instagram? Because I want this to be fresh. There's just some nuances in there where I think that we can do it in a way that's professional. And yeah, sorry, go ahead, Candace. No, I think you were gonna. No, I was gonna say, I mean, I, as a dealer, I know what it, to, or an antique seller, I know what it takes to source, to find, to buy a piece. I am never expecting a discount from another dealer. I'll ask, and if they say no, I completely respect their opinion. It is their their right to say yes or no. Um, I will always give a discount if I can, um, because for me, I want to move inventory. So, do I want it to sit on the shelf at twelve dollars or get it off my shelf for nine? You know, like <laughs> then I can move it. Um, but I I think. It's perfectly okay to ask for a discount, um, but I think it's also, again, how you do it. Or if you're like, you're expecting a discount, like, oh, you, I'm a dealer and you're a dealer and you, no, it's all in how you ask. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this long enough like you, that you, you have relationships with people and now they come to you or you go to them mm -hmm. and like you said it's a trade deal um but i have some mentors in the business and they say the same thing like something move like at a brimfield one piece will move to four dealers before the end of the show so, mm -hmm. so you know i mean that's just the way before instagram that's just the way things worked yeah. um but if you're kind and you show that you're you're genuinely interested in an item and that you respect their time and their their um, knowledge on the item, nine times out of 10, they're gonna give you a discount. But if you go in there like, I need a discount. It's I'm not a the dealer. way to do it. <laughs> yeah, right, like, give me your best, give me your best deal. Like, it's all in how you approach a situation. Mm -hmm. and, and on the, and it was interesting, my mentors, told me this was funny because we were talking about dealing and stuff and they were like oh yeah we used to have these kids walk into our store and be like i'm a dealer will you give me a discount and he's like well where's your sales tax your retail sales tax license where's your business license and they're like uh he's like yeah i'm not giving you a discount <laughs> <laughs> but so now I do want to link this back to one question I got on Instagram from a seller because now we're flipping it kind of the other direction because we're talking about dealer to dealer buys. Um, someone said, hold, how do you hold firm on pricing and deal with constantly being asked for discounts? Okay, so this is someone who's a seller talking about customers asking for discounts. So how I, how I do this, I have a 10% off coupon on my website. You get a 10% off coupon when you order from me, you know. And honestly, when we're dealing with really small items that are like under $100, I'm probably not going to 
going to go more than 10% on it. But if you're talking about an item that's between 100 and 1,000, you know, then I, I know what my margin is. I know where I need to be, and we can negotiate a little bit. Um, but for, mo for the vast majority of things on my website, I just make it automatic. Like if someone is, if you're constantly being asked for discounts, be like, you know, this, this is my 10% off coupon. I just make it standard. It applies to everyone. And then I don't have to think on every single one what my response is going to be. Use the coupon. <laughs> but that's different because I have a website and a shop. Right. So how do you guys, um, and also, so if it has to, it's usually an item that's been on my website for a while before I consider negotiating. You know, if I just posted it and you're offering me, you know, 30% less, I'm probably going to be like, no, it's got to sit on the market a little bit longer. But how do you guys um, navigate that? Well, I think it depends. I mean, if you're constantly giving discounts, then people are going to never expect to pay full price with you. So you don't want, you don't want to be like Macy's with a one day sale, like every week <laughs> type of a thing. It's like, oh, I'm always going to have a discount. So like, let me just wait. Or like same thing with like live sales. If you go through the whole live and a lot of people do this and if it's, if it aligns with your profit margin, then fine. But a lot of people will discount every single item in the recap. So then who's to say that people won't just wait for the recap to purchase the item because then they're going to get it discounted. So I think it's dependent upon each person, I think, and like the items that you're providing and if you're willing to go lower. I mean, if I show an item the first time and it's brand new and I, I know it's worth X amount, I'll keep it firm at that price. If someone buys, like, okay, recently with Inkwell. So someone asked me for Inkwells privately, and I sent her a picture of all the ones that I had, and I said they're this much each. But if someone buys in bulk, then you could work with them to get a little bit of a discount because I'm not selling another four. I'm not selling four Inkwells to four different people that need four different boxes, that need to be four different invoices, that, like, all that could, I'm doing it with one person. So I can shave a few dollars off because she's saving me time. I don't have to save, I don't have to sell those to four different people. I can sell them to one person. So I think it, it depends. I, I would say every um, instance is a little bit different for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, or someone reaches out and says, Hey, do you have a 12 inch ironstone pitcher? And it's been sitting here for three months. I might list it in a live sale for a hundred, but because again, like Nicole said, they're reaching out to, I'm not doing anything, but literally taking it, taking a picture and packing it. I might say 90 for, you know, because it takes out all the, the extra work. Um, and like, like Nicole said, I don't, if it's something new and I've just showed it for the first time, I don't reduce the price. Um, that's just the way. I do. I don't get asked a lot for discounts, um, but I'm not opposed to them if the situation, you know, mm -hmm. like it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask, but I don't, you know, I don't get asked a ton for discounts. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I'm reading the comments. Um, this is so fun. Oh, I was going to tell you something too that kind of reminded me because I did have a friend who she had a customer who was like, oh, you know, this is $30. Well, so-and-so sells her for 20, you know, and that can come up. We can really be like, we can take that personally. I mean, I would, because inside you got to feel it like <laughs> slightly, slightly offended. And what I, I, and what I told her, I was like, you know what you say? That's great. I'm glad you found a great bargain. You can go buy it from her. Mm -hmm. Great. Go buy it from her. I mean, mm -hmm. because there, she's going to sell all of hers and I'll be the only one with them anymore. Supply will go up, go down. Demand will go up. I mean, what can you say? Like I, you can't, I cannot control what other people are pricing their items at. I can only control how I sell and how I do that. And so you just have to like not get offended and not get your feelings hurt, you know, and just kind of <laughs> move on. Just keep selling. We're not upset. <laughs> no. We're just talking about really intense, intense subjects right now. So also I'm dying because Cinda said, what do you say when someone asks you who your sources are? 
I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Um, we used to tease, take her out to a bar, so then we, she will tell us her sources. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've everywhere. I've had a few people ask about, like, who my sources are in England if, and if I could share them. And well, well, I don't. I mean, I'm, I try to be as polite as possible, and it's not about, like, sharing is caring kind of a thing. It's, like, I feel like it's, like, a touchy subject a little bit. But, like, honestly, I would never, and I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but I don't, like, if Candace had somebody or if Whitney had somebody in England, I don't know if I would have the guts to be, like, hey, who's your contact so I could, like, piggyback on that. Like, I feel like it's, like, a little... Well, it, like, it's, I feel like it has to do with like manners a, a little bit, like because it's not like they're yeah. wholesale. So my response was, it's not like this person is a wholesaler. It's not like they produce the item and they have thousands of this item, and then they're just looking for dealers to buy the item and sell them. That's completely different. Like mm -hmm. this person is going out and sourcing these items, just like us, and then they're selling it to people that are looking to buy them, and then sell them wherever they're located so like maybe in england that item is not worth a lot but over here it is so like i buy in bulk and then i try to be reasonable with the prices to like sell to my customers but this person doesn't have an infinite supply and most of the time it's hard enough to get a hold of them because they have so many other customers that they're dealing with so like and it takes a lot of time i mean i don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm hoarding these people and I'm not going to like share, but like mm -hmm. it takes time and effort and yes. it's a learning curve and it's hit or miss. I mean, I'm gambling on this person. I'm sending them five, $600 at a time. Mm -hmm. I'm just being yes. honest today. Yes. I just sent like almost $400 to this one guy in England and I have to just assume that everything's going to arrive safely and no damage. And if there is damage that, he's going to take responsibility and refund me. So I feel like all of that background work that we do, it it just seems weird for someone to be like, hey, like who is your contact? So I can like, I can get in touch with them. Yeah, it's not like you're asking for like who your chiropractor is. You're, you know, there's a lot of time that goes into finding these people. When I start, like when I started three years ago, there was someone that I used, they were new, I was new. I got a box and more than half of the stuff was broken. And I was like, uh, so I let them go. We've both evolved and now I use them again because you know, we both ebb and flow when we grow and I was willing to give them a second chance. But it takes a lot of time and like Nicole said, I mean, sometimes like I just got a box in I've gotten two boxes in the last month and it was over a thousand dollars worth of goods. That's a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of sourcing. And like, like Nicole said, I'm not there to tangibly, tangi tangibly pick up the item and look at it and say, okay, this is authentic. It's in good shape. I feel comfortable selling this to a customer. We're trusting someone. And there's a lot of trust that we have to, to put out there that we're going to get what you know what we paid for back so mm -hmm. i i think it's absolutely fair that we don't have to share our sources and if someone wants to know i'll say hey i started on ebay or mm -hmm. i started on etsy and i paid way too much money mm -hmm. but at least i started a conversation mm -hmm. and i said mm -hmm. hey i'm a dealer maybe we can have a working relationship you just have to put your feelers out there yep you Yes, there are people that are commenting. I, so, yes, I will say that I'm sorry I can't disclose their contact information. I hope you understand. But I do offer, like, hey, like Candace said, and I told this to people recently. I said, listen, I went on eBay. I searched for an item. I looked at the dealers that came up that had that item. You look at their ratings. You look at their, um, why can't I think of the word? Their reviews. So at least like a platform like eBay or Etsy has a way that you can look to see if they're reliable. You can see their star ratings. And I offered some suggestions. So the way I started, I just, I mean, I honestly just typed in English Inkwell 
and I look to see what vendors in England, because you can look at the where they're shipping from. I looked at vendors in England. I looked at the rest of their items, and I went from there. And you could reach out to them. I would highly recommend reaching out to them and saying, "Hi, I'm from the states. Do you? Sh I'm just confirming you ship here, and do you offer bulk shipping?" Like I tried to provide as much information as I could to that person, so then they could take those tools to find someone on their own. I'm not going to completely dismiss them and say, oh, no, I'm not going to send you their information. Bye. Mm -hmm. Like, I will try to help you out to, like, navigate you to the right direction. But. Yes. And, and Lauren says exactly what I was going to say. My primary source in the UK has explicitly told me, do not share my name with anyone, especially with other UK dealers, because. The more I've learned about the UK dealer market is it's very cutthroat. It's like truffle hunting. Yes. Um, especially if you're a, especially if you're a digger, if you're someone who goes out and digs up items um, out of the ground to sell like the pots and stuff. Um, like the other dealers will go and they'll see who the customers are of a competitor and then basically go, what do they call that customer? There's like a word for it where you go and you steal customers from other competitive competitors. I don't know why the word scalping is coming to my mind. It's what, anyway, I mean, so, so there's, they definitely want to keep it under wraps. And my dealer has told me like, I don't want to work with more than just a handful of people that I trust. It's too much work. Poaching. Thank you. I was like scalping. That makes sense. Poaching. So they don't want to, they don't want their customers poached. And so I really have to, acquisition. That's, that's much. Yes. We don't call it poaching, it's called acquisition. Uh, so um, you just have to respect the boundaries that the dealers put on, you know, and and do that. So yeah, it's it's just one of those one of those things. Okay, we are getting kind of long, but there is one topic. I feel really bad for saving this to the last because it's like the biggest topic that I think pertains to the integrity of shop owners, and it is the authenticity of items which we sell. Now, I want to also say, you know, this problem has been around for as long as antiques have been sold in the world. The fact that there are a lot of um, de dealers who sell things, whether inadvertently or in purpose, they represent them as something they are not. Because what if I, you know, I mean, I can do this with anything, right? And we have to, we have to acknowledge the power that we have as antique dealers. Let me, let me just say, what if I told you like this ladle, this beautiful sterling silver ladle was actually obtained from the country house of a famous English aristocrat who uh, was lady in waiting to Queen Mary in the early 1900s and was witness to numerous royal scandals. Royal lips have sipped from this ladle, right? And you can have it for the, the small price of, of $100, right? Well, it's just a 1920 silver plate ladle. But dealers, you, how you present something, what you say, what you don't say, you could, you could say things that are not even, exp you're not expecting explicitly lying, but how we present things is so important to the integrity of our business. Um, so can we talk just a little bit about how to do our research into the authenticity of items? Because someone also had a really, really good question. Claim 100. <laughs> oh, that was very, you put your white gloves on, you give a pretty story. I mean, anyone can do it. So how, especially when you are looking online for, when you're looking online, you've, like I've been through this with a couple of bronze statues that I have, trying to find comps online, trying to find the history, like how do you actually ensure that what you're reading online, what you see other sellers, like, oh my gosh, that Instagram seller said this was this and I have something identical, so it must be right. You know, how do we make sure that what we're selling is, is actually what we say it is? So I try to find a few sources, and if I can't have two or three sources that accurately identify 
identify the item or the time period or the origin, then I won't say definitely that this item is such and such. And I used this as an example in our last shop talk, I think, or our live sale, maybe it was, I don't remember. But like, okay, so I have, just for instance, I have two pictures that look exactly the same. One is marked to Pilco on the bottom and one it has no marking. So the Apilco one, definitely it's marked to Pilco. I know it's from France. Okay, that one is a French pitcher. Now this other one that looks exactly the same, mm -hmm. same material when you touch it, like when you tap on it, it makes the same noise, the same style, everything, but it has no marking. I'm not going to say that that's a French pitcher because I don't know for certain if it is a French pitcher. So I think mm -hmm. you could do as much research as you want. You can use Google Lens. Everybody uses Google Lens now for identifying items, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those sources are accurate. I mean, if you put something on eBay and you ask $500 for this item, it doesn't mean that because that person has it up for $500, then that's the value of the item, because I could put anything, I could put this pen up for $300. It's not going to sell for $300, but a lot of people use, oh, well, it's going for this much on eBay, it's like, is it though? Are people actually buying it or are people just listing it for that much? So I think like research has, it's hard with the internet because anybody could do whatever they want on there. I could, I mean, yeah, this could be up there for who knows how much type of a thing because it's all dependent upon who posts it and what they post it for. So I think research is definitely key. And if you can't find accurate solid proof of an item being like say this i have a bottle and i know that it's mouth blown because it doesn't have the theme that goes up the side so i could tell that it's antique it could be from the 1850s to the 1920s anywhere in that range so i'll just say it's antique um exact age unknown if it doesn't have any writing on it origin unknown but like based on your research, based on like your knowledge of an item and how deep you go into researching an item, that's what that's what I think you should provide in your write up, in your listing. Like I wouldn't say, oh, it's from France if it's not from France. Right. How do I know? I bought it from France. Okay, Doesn't that's matter. great. You bought something from the U.S. It could be from Korea. It could be from Taiwan. It could be from China. It could be from England. It could be from all over the place. Just because it's coming from the U.S. doesn't mean that it's from the U.S. So if you don't know something 100%, I would not put it in your listing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I agree with Nicole like that it all goes back to integrity. If you can't verify that something is from somewhere or you don't know 100% what it is then say that it's much better to be honest up front because nine times out of ten the person will probably still want it but they'll take it's much easier to say I don't know where this is from but I have a general idea of the time period like Nicole said it makes it again it goes back to like honesty and telling the person i'm not 100 percent sure this is the little bit i do know about the item and they'll be like wow okay they were honest with me and they told me the truth and i feel comfortable doing business with them mm -hmm. yeah because uh, i really feel that we're at a point with the internet with knowledge and with the connections that we can make with other dealers through Instagram and locally, there's really no excuse for um, us not doing our research. And I, Google Lens is like a great starting point. It's like a place to start, maybe to get a name, maybe to just start figuring out who the maker is. And I use a lot of language like the style is consistent with blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, this is consistent with the age and this is why. Um, I even have a this, I think I showed it last week or the week before, but I have these two um, 19th century bronze statues and one of them's even signed and I'm like, is this really, is this really by this guy? Is it, is it forged? I mean, I'm very questioning now. One of my biggest things I'm going to bring up um is artwork because i see i 
I, and, and it's not just me. I've talked with a lot of dealers. Um, I've talked with a lot of dealers who deal in art and antiques. They know their shiz and they're just like, I cannot believe. Okay. I actually pulled up a message from this art dealer. I was talking with this morning. Cause I'm like, I'm literally going to, I'm literally going to quote you, um, about this. And she was like the art, uh, uh, what did she say? She was like, yeah, it is a huge, it is the biggest con job on Instagram right now is antique artwork and paintings being sold um, as antique when in fact there it's factory art from China and there, and I know I've done some education and the reason some people are like, Whitney, stop talking about the factory art, but it's just something that keeps coming back. Like someone sent me a profile and I have, and it was, all labeled as like, like fact, it was all labeled as like vintage hand painted, handmade original paintings. And then you flip it over the back and it's clearly been washed uh, like a dark color to make it look old. There's staples all over the back of the frame. The wood is not old. And I was like, um, I recognize these because I literally have seen these exact paintings, sellers buying these paintings and then reselling them as antiques in their live sales and on their Instagram sales. And going to their website, there's no personal information. They're in California, which is a huge red flag because, you know, what receives most of the shipping containers from China? They're, they're hitting, they're in San Francisco and Sacramento. <laughs> um, and so I do think that anytime that you are selling something for hundreds of dollars, you cannot, and it was very interesting talking to this dealer. She's like, I think, you know, they, these newer dealers, they see art selling at really high prices. They're like, oh, I have one that's just like that. And they don't do the research. They get a little lazy. They get a little greedy. Um, or maybe they just get really excited. Like, oh, I have this piece. And I've had people send me photos of paintings. I'm like, yeah, that's by like, that's factory art. If you look up that artist and that painting, there's hundreds of others on the internet. I exactly like it. I don't care that you saw someone selling that for $500. Like it is... <laughs> It's all from a factory. And so it doesn't matter whether, whether you, whether you sell an item for $10 or $500, like you have, that's fraud. If you're selling something as an antique and it's not, that's like a legal term. It is fraud. And you have to be so careful about it because you will get yourself in hot water when we get really slack about doing our due diligence. Okay. That's my, I'm getting off the soapbox now. <laughs> You see the comments? Uh, no, I haven't been seeing the comments because I was talking. I just, but I'm sure they're absolutely fabulous. Um, do you guys have any? I know you guys don't do a ton of artwork, um, but I don't. But now that I now that I've watched your reel, like now I know what to look for, and I've I've mm -hmm. really really been mindful about what I purchase and if I purchase artwork I'm very transparent like if I look it up and I know it's the real deal or if it's not I say it I think to your point when you like to sell sorry factory art comments but you have to disclose that it's not Again. from Picasso <laughs> you know like you can't just say oh I have this antique Ooh. oil painting yeah it's, it's if there's yeah Yep. Um, yeah, someone said you're way too polite in the USA. In Europe, your name will be all over if you're not honest about a product. Zenda says, all we have in sellers in this business is our name and our integrity. 100% refund if I ever accidentally misrepresent. I 100% agree with you. 100%. Your money back, don't give me the item back. Just, we've all been fooled with reproductions, even after 37 years. You know, and I think that's the important thing to recognize is like, if we ever do get it wrong, it's a learning opportunity for us. We all learn. I mean, it's, it's been going on for, I read a book from 1987 that was about selling antiques and they're in there. They were talking about people faking like the chippy blue paint that we all love to see on the Swedish, um, you know, furniture or different kind of age and patina. You can fake a lot of stuff. So you know, all we can do really is try our best to do our homework and to represent things accurately.
um, and do not sell until you can say with confidence what it is, what it is not, and what you think it is, and what mm -hmm. your evidence is backing that up. Not just because so and so sold the same thing last week. Um, yeah. Uh, so let me see if you guys have any questions. I feel like we've pretty much addressed most of the questions um being asked to pay the invoice right away oh my gosh debbie yeah you said sorry i'm reading the comments mm -hmm. debbie who is a customer basically said it makes me feel like they took my money and ran when they demand that we pay the invoice right away but then they don't ship the item for weeks yeah like i can see why that that would be a hard um like that would make you f upset <laughs> Um, so if you guys have any questions or anything else, uh, did we, Nicole and Candace, is there anything that we have not covered that you, you guys want to talk about? Just looking through it. Um, we talked about policies. We talked about mm -hmm. pricing, um, and dating things. Tell more life sales though. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Alexis. And then they proceed to have 12 more live sales that week. Yeah. Oh, I know that. Yeah. yeah. Shipping always takes priority but for me. And I think I you, want... you have to like have those frank conversations with yourself. Like, whoa, I'm, I'm behind on shipping. So maybe I need to not do this live sale tonight. Or, you know, maybe if it's in your budget, you maybe hire someone to help you with, mm -hmm. like, you have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I yeah. try to perfectly space out sales. Sometimes it happens when there's like three in a week, but then I'll just say at the beginning of the week, hey, this week I have three sales. And I'll do like the daily schedule and then like a blurb at the next slide. And I'll say, all invoices will happen after the last sale. But if you shop on Monday and you want your item ASAP, let me know. Otherwise, I'm not going to invoice until Saturday because that's like the third sale of the week type thing. Right. And again, it's all about being open and, and like literally telling over communicating what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like you may have every intention to ship on Monday. But I mean, for instance, my husband's in Nigeria. He got sick. I thought I was going to have to fly there last weekend and it was in the hospital. Like if I had to go to Nigeria and I just left and didn't say, Hey, you know, my husband's in the hospital. I, everything's on hold. That's one thing. But if I just left and didn't communicate, that's a whole other situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we, we did have, okay. We're, we're having a couple questions come in about shipping and how to handle specific situations. I think in general, like if, if someone is not communicating with you, then I think, what is that word? We're taking it up the next step. Um, you know, do what you need to do to either get your money back or if they're not responding, you unfortunately just have to stop shipping with them. Someone, um, seller, okay. And padding shipping, I was going to say, you know, everyone handles it. Like some sellers don't charge for the shipping supplies. Like I have a $1 handling fee and that just allows me to like make sure that I can pack. I mean, I, I use more than a dollar's worth of shipping supplies in every box I send yeah. out, you know. So, and if someone, a customer were to ask me that, I tell them like, that's what the handling fee is, you know. Okay, so now someone did ask about what do you think about everyone doing auction items in lives? Now, I'm not sure if she means auctions, um, like straight auctions. I mean, I have no problem with straight auctions during live sales, but I think this is something that we kind of touched on last week. Someone had asked, or last month, I think, oh, because we did the open Q&A. Mm -hmm. Someone asked about... Um, bit like if there are multiple claims on an item it flips to an auction have you seen this candace mm -hmm. um the thing is there's nothing illegal about doing that 
Mm -mm. There's nothing wrong. I just encourage you, you know, your customers have to know that's what's going to happen. And also like, think about how that customer who was the first claim, like how they felt when, if that happens, that's, I mean, and if you think, if you consider that and you're like, oh, well, you know, even though that first customer was mad, they didn't get the item and they couldn't afford the escalated um, price, but I'm happy because I got more money. If that's the kind of business you want to run, that's your choice. But I really want to value each customer equally. Um, and so to me, it's important to not run my sales that way. There's, but, and again, maybe all of your customers, if all of your customers know that's what's going to happen, you know, um, it just gets really sticky ethically. What, you know, and I know Nicole and I chatted about this some, what do you, what do you think, Candace? Um, I, I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. Um, now if you have an auction item, like some, you know, you you have 10 rounds and one item is an auction item. That's fine. As long as you, I say, it's, you know, like you're disclosing that you're having one item that's an auction item, but I don't like making it turn into an auction item because there's nine claims or however that works. And I'm not a fan of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, if we could all predict how there are going to be 10 backups on an item, you know, we would all be in a really good, good place. You'd never know. So I think if you offer it for a straight price, you be fair and you keep it as a straight price. You don't then flip to auction because 94 people are now interested in it. Yeah. Someone had an interesting point because um, claims to bids allows you to potentially price items lower to begin with and allows people with a slow internet to win an item. I was like, well, actually, that's a very, that's a really interesting point. See, I wouldn't have I've thought about it that way. Um, so again, we're, we're, you're, and some people are saying that you're sad it's claims because you, yeah, have an internet. No, we're not selling anything today. Well, apparently I sold a ladle for a hundred dollars that was inaccurately represented, <laughs> but no. So yeah, it's just think, so my suggestion, here's my suggestion is I think customer service has a lot to do with being really proactive. So you're, if you know that you're going to have claims to bid, like if you're going to allow that flip, I want you to think through what am I going to say to customers who message me really upset that they didn't get an item? Like, I think that, like, how am I going to make, we can't make everyone happy a hundred percent of the time, but you right now, we've got a lot of feedback from customers who are saying they don't like that. So how are you going to handle the, the next time that a customer responds to you in that way? How are we going to, you know, treat them with respect and kindness and all of that? So I do think that if you choose to have shop rules that are maybe a bit more challenging or, you know, just think about how you're going to deal with that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I see the comments that are coming through about like internet seeds, but anytime you buy anything online, whether you're on Etsy, whether you're buying concert tickets, if you're buying anything, if someone gets into their cart and they check out, check out faster than you, then you miss out on it. So like, I don't That's a good point. You can't think about like, like auctions as being like, oh, this is like the fairest way for everybody to buy something. Because if, say, if I have an um, limitless wallet and I'm like, oh, I want that item, I'll pay 300 for it because I want it, then that's not fair for the person if the item is only really worth $20 and the person was looking to buy it for $20. So I think there's a lot of like pros and cons with everything, but this is why I personally like Instagram better because you don't have to like worry about like if there's a drop or like an Etsy restock or anything like that when there's only one of each item and then you have to go and you have to check out, add all the items to your cart and check out faster than somebody else and then someone else had bought the one item in your cart while you're doing all that. Like on a live you can claim throughout the whole live and then you check out at the end. So like I think there's pros and cons to doing auctions or not and just having fixed prices but yeah it is unfortunate i mean i've had i've been in that same situation where i'm like oh i really want that and i stayed up and i like watched that whole live sale to like claim that one item and then 
I wasn't fast enough. Dude. I've, I've dragged my toddler out to an estate sale two hours before I opened, played on the sidewalk, and then followed in the lady who walked in and took the two quilts mm -hmm. that I came for. Life is mm -hmm. not, I mean, this makes, wow, sorry. My parenting background is coming back. Like, the most we can do is try to make it fair for everyone. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's not always going to be fair for everyone. So, um, you know, I think. I think consistency so that your customers know what to expect from you consistently is so important because yeah, it's, I always think of Mick Jagger. I sing that to my kids. You don't know. Anyway. So we just try to give people the most opportunity, the most equal opportunities that we can, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to be too much. Suck it up. <laughs> it sounds so terrible. I've been with my kids too much this summer. So or if you like Emily, who's like, there's always more junk. So like, if you are like, oh man, I missed out on that. It wasn't a one-time release. There might be more coming down the pipeline and they might even be cheaper. So look at it on the bright side. Like, oh, I missed out on that one, but maybe I'll find one at the thrift store or at a garage sale for like $5. Or eBay. Or eBay. eBay. eBay has a lot of stuff, guys. All right. Um, last chance for any questions or anything, you know, um, just pray that the Instagram reel gets saved and we'll get it posted up. Everyone needs to like take some deep cleansing breaths after this. Go for a walk. This has been a very intense conversation. Are you, are you ladies feeling okay after all I this? Think it was great. I think it was great. And I think it needed to be said. So not in, a, not in a negative way, but like, yeah. you know, yeah. people are so afraid. They tiptoe around things. And I think it's okay to have conversations as long as it's done respectfully. And I think it was a great conversation to have. Mm -hmm. This is like Shop Talk 2.0, where we're, <laughs> we're moving up in the... <laughs> thank you for having, the depth. having me. So, oh, Candace, thank you for coming on for like... For this topic, you were the right person. And oh man, just there's so much. And you guys can always message us or post comment like questions on on stuff um, as far as, yeah, on our reel or the YouTube. People comment on YouTube a lot, which is nice because then you can go and see it. Yeah, don't, yes, just pray the reel. What, we had one episode where it didn't post. So now I'm always just like a little paranoid. Um, and then, so yes, you can comment YouTube and I'll get the replay hope up hopefully later this afternoon. Our next, um, shop talk is going to be on August 7th. We are changing the time. Okay. We have done, uh, oh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys. Um, we're ch just so you guys know, we are shifting the time for Shop Talk to 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We're shifting it to earlier in the morning, and that's just because of kids' schedules and always giving us a little bit more time to uh, work on. Anyway, you don't need all the details. We're just changing the time, okay? So just pay attention to that on Instagram. Like I said, August 7th, that's the, always the first Wednesday. And we're going to be talking with Jennifer from Shared Belongings about photo styling. Really? Which I'm so excited. Like product styling, photography, um, that's a topic that you guys had wanted. And it's one that is a little bit, I, we'll figure out ways to make it fun. Like we'll get our, um, we'll sh show how we style and stuff. She was here huh? the last week. She's been with me. She just left. Rub it up. And Man. I've learned so many things from her about photography, and I am so grateful for the time that she was able to be here. So you guys are we're so in for a treat. Mm -hmm. We're so excited. I'm going to put her handle. I can't remember if her handle is. It's just shared belongings. I'm mm -hmm. just going to. Get, she'll get tagged in this. So you guys can go and follow her and. Yeah, um, and we're here for you. So just always let us know if there's topics or things that you would like us to tackle in Shop Talk. And have a wonderful Independence Day tomorrow. So Thanks, if you're in guys. the US. All right, bye. All right, guys, take care. Bye-bye.